It was a four bedroom old house, a colonial house. Uh, I was delivered by a midwife, uh, which was my aunt. Okay. And that's where I was raised. And matter of fact, I stay a few miles from the house. Might be a half a mile from the house. The house is still standing. My mother was uh, Rhoda Gibbs, and my father was Charles Williams. Later on, they got married, and her name became Rhoda uh, W. Williams. Eight. There's eight of us in all. Okay. And Where are you? First born in the middle? No, I'm number five. number five. Every time we have a reunion, we have our number for everybody won't get confused. We said this is not, he is number five. <laughs> <laughs> well, Geechee mean is with a, with a, a lot of people got it with an accent. And a lot of people always tell me that uh, I have a Gullah accent. And, uh, and I always feel like it was not something that we, in, we inherit that from uneducated other people and the way how they speak. Okay. Because I've known, I worked with the Forest Service for 29 years and there was a guy named Danny Carlson and he lived in New York City. Now you can tell if he is a, a he is not a Yankee anymore. <laughs> he have a Southern accent. He law. So I always figure, Gullah, I mean, if you hang around someone long enough, then you be you begin to speak Gullah. Gullah, how proper your English or how proper you are, it will rub off. Okay. I never worked. On a, on a slave farm. Okay. But I worked for a man named York McGinnis, which was a black guy, and he had a cotton field, watermelon field, okra, tomato. Okay. I would rather have worked for the white man because <laughs> he was a slave driver. Okay. And he only gave you like, uh, was a penny, to, a penny, a hundred pound of cotton. Now, it doesn't match my age because you remember now, in the uh, in the fifty, we were still picking cotton, corn, and in in, the, in, uh, in McClellanville, everything was still as it was until you know, till the Democrat get in the or Republican got in and start getting things from overseas or right. further out, and then that did away with all that in Ma, in McClellanville. Okay. But th my childhood, we used to love that going picking oyster. Uh, uh, flounder gigging, uh, 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 thing we call mullet. We used to get a mullet net and we used to cast for mullet in the winter time because they bunched together. And me and my friend got a wheelbarrow and we used to go through the neighborhood and sell 25 fish for a quarter. <laughs> well, we were rich. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. My friend uh, Alton Shepard, he used to make little model boat when he was little. And my father used to make, you know, canes and, uh, and you know, I wasn't old enough to learn too much, but I used to always say I'm carving a stick. And, you know, you know, kid stick now. And, 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 uh, and uh, sure enough, in the years to pass, I saw my older brother doing it. And I got interested in it. Okay. And then that's how I got started. He was one of the guys that work at the Navy Yard. Okay. And this guy hired him. Cause he was, my father was about 6'3", probably 280, big, big, big guy. So we didn't, if he said jump, we just jump. <laughs> he was big. And so what we did is, uh, is uh, he started, he made a stick for the guy because uh, he was a colonel. So he gave it to the colonel and someone saw the stick that the colonel had and 
this one wanted a stick and that one wanted a stick and that's that's how his part got started but before that he was just like somebody needed a stick my you know it was was a free thing he just give it to it but for my ancestors my the story that my brother or my father it came from way back during slavery time when people needed a crutch or people needed a walking stick cuz see my ancestors them was good farmers which my grandfather was and that, that uh I did a lot of work for him also while I was little and uh and they said it passed down cuz he made uh crutches and walking stick and believe it or not he also made tables out of cypress knee now and uh, now we up here in the in uh, probably in the uh 80s or the yeah the 80s hey I was making table but I didn't I didn't know that you see I didn't know that at the time but now I know that he uh he did all those things too so that tradition is still in the family but now my grandson is the only one that is interested and he is 15 now but he's also he taller than me so he's six probably six two and a half but he is more interested in football <laughs> in McClanville it was uh it was uh, you know had second grade school uh we had a lunch i used to hate that it had a lunch cafeteria milk was like two cents two cents a cart no little tiny cart and a uh, honey bun was like i think a nickel sodas was 10 cent and that's what we had to look for every lunch but my mother used to make us sandwiches and you had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich you had a, a bologna sandwich or a lunch meat sandwich and uh you, you never get no uh, like chicken right. you no know, no that's that's it was strictly for the house okay and uh so we used to go to school and take the bag but but but, but uh if you got a greasy bag they tease you so you had to put two bag in one so and then you couldn't see the uh the greasy bag <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> that that was fun. And the clothes that we wear was eight of us. Okay. It was always hand me down. So I had three brothers. And when it got to me, it was if I had run out of sound like a motorcycle going down the road. Oh, holy. And and so that's the way we grew up and every day you get home, you still had chores to do. cuz we still had wood stove we had to cut wood rake the yard or daddy would tell you got some bean to pick in the uh, garden and and it was no you know no holly uh you didn't hardly get too much whooping okay. unless you you know you had to really do something okay. big time okay. <laughs> but uh uh we all eight grew up together and my older brother Charles which a lot of people call CC he the one that used to do the sticks uh and he is 70 74 and of eight of us is still living in that America yeah i say you know yeah yeah all my teacher was good all them was good uh uh miss singleton uh uh miss uh my aunt miss adams would she work which her first uh she is 96 now and she she taught on sandy she was one of the first teachers on sandy island and and believe it or not all of my wife uh uncles and her mother sisters and brothers my aunt taught and and uh by the when my aunt left sandy island my wife had just went started school so so and then you figure 30 something years later uh matter of fact we met once but we didn't know okay. i went to a funeral on sandy island so my aunt had a baby 
So I had to go to take, you know, watch, watch little Joe. And my wife was there because she might have been about in ninth grade. I might have been about in tenth, tenth, tenth grade. And we remember the funeral and everything, but couldn't remember one another. And 11 years later, we met and got married. Now we're married 42 years. Oh What's your wife's name? Evangeline Williams. Okay. A lot of people call her Vangie. Some call him Evangelist. Okay. And she's a lousy, just don't call her late. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an unusual name. A lot of people don't have that name. That yeah, so I never did ask her how she got her or who named her. Uh, but otherwise than that, uh, out of the eight, out of the uh, four of our kids, we adopted one, and then we raised 13 in our house. All working on a salary of five dollars and something cent an hour. <laughs> but I used to hustle, cut wood, uh, trees for people, so you know, God made a way. <laughs> I got to see my father. I mean, uh, the kids now say that uh, that's my hero. Uh, 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 you know, I just love. I've never left my father. Wherever he go, I went. Crabbing, fishing, everything, everything. And now, now some of my other brother, like my older brother, now he, if I had to pick another role model, uh, excuse me, a role model, he would be it. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he got some, he knew some stuff. And what I mean, like, how to fish, how to, or how to, t sometimes he tell you the way, how to hold the knife, how to take the, you know, sometimes you just go there and dig it. And, and, you know, and uh, how to build a house at, uh, believe it or not, at the age of 15, I built my first house. Whole house. Me and two guys, me and uh, one more guy. And this lady was living in a shack. And we told the shack now, take the boat off it and build the house back up. And my father, you know, was telling, you know, he'll go up there on Saturday and look at it and say, we got to tear that board down, boy, that ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't right, you got to put that over here. And so, you know, he was guiding us a little bit. And, uh, and uh, my algae culture teacher took the class up there and showed him and said, see, it's not who you are is what you want to be. You see, now that term was given to us a long time, but my father was, I mean, he knew everything. He knew everything, and then he was a big man anyway, so I said, boy, I want to be like my daddy. I said, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I love that. So that. So that was your teacher saying that, it's not who you are, but what you want to be. Yes. Because, see, I didn't, uh, Believe it or not, I've built or, or remodeled houses for people. And, and uh, you know, like I'm saying, no school. Right. Only thing I had, we used to call it, I think they call it carpenter shop now or shop. Right. We used to call it algae culture. You see, when you go in there, you get everything. You get right from brick mason right on up, right on up. And you took that in high school? Yes. So did you start like ninth grade, tenth grade? When did you no, start? Uh, ninth grade. Yeah, you had to start that in that, yes. All the way to twelfth grade? Yes. Okay. And I fail every test. <laughs> well, <everybody> test. <laughs> but now, you know, those were, those, uh, my father and my brother was the, uh, after my father died, then, I, you know, my brother, you know, start. You know, you know, took over as the oldest one, and, and, and uh, I'm, he, he did good. He did real good. Remember, with eight, eight siblings that my father had, we we, we didn't had no ham, okay. store bought ham. Okay. We didn't ever eat a duck okay. out of the store or anything like this. Everything we ate was home grown. And my father said the same thing, if I knew how to make salt and all them other things, uh, sugar, 
he, he, he wouldn't have to buy anything. We had pear for the, you know, in the summertime, you get the pear, my mother can it, uh, the bean, can it, okra, can it, peach, can it, pear, can, you know, apple, can it, corn, can it, everything was my father grew, and that's what we, we, we ate. Now, chicken, yard chicken, that's all we eat. Uh, and, uh, I don't eat that today, but eggplant. Uh, it look almost like egg when you when you fry it. Right. The, oh man, he used to love that. And uh, but we had to eat what they eat. Right. right. And uh, on Friday, whatever got left over, uh, my mother used to call it port luck. Put everything together. <laughs> you may find this, and you may find that. But then my mother had a strict rule. Daddy eat first. All of we used to get to the table and eat together, but daddy got first. And since I was the baby boy, I always got the butt. The butt of the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, they used to I She I, said, I can't wait till I grow up, but I didn't realize when I grow up, they could be grow they growing up, they still gonna be growing up too. <laughs> but you know, like we, we had, uh, everything out the garden uh, and everything w which you couldn't do in the winter, because that when we used to have real winter, right. you couldn't do nothing out there, but everything was canned and jaw. So those was some of the good things. Okay. Good food. Hogs, yeah, yeah, hog, uh, uh, we didn't raise no cow, all he raised was hog. So that's where we got our ham. And then he had a smokehouse. You don't see that no more. You see, now that's not saying that I'm that old. Right. But, people had but we, you know, living in McLennanville, we wasn't, you know, from Charleston, you know, that's 37 miles. Nobody had no car. Right. Take it uh, two days to get their horses and wagon. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to you had to survive for right there. Yeah. Yeah, and then sometime when, say, if someone kill a hoe, then, because you know we, we had we didn't we, we didn't had no electricity, so but we had an ice truck come by, so what what happened if I kill a hoe, you give the next the next person who got hoe, you give them half of the hoe so you, all the meat wouldn't get small. Had bacon, that you pork chop, we had everything. The older people uh, had wisdom. We go under the house. They didn't want you to go under the house. They didn't want you to go in the bush. Now, boys could have go in the bush. Girls couldn't. Boys could go under the house, but girls couldn't. It took me years to find out why. Because the seller said, if we go under the house, there's a black snake. And the black snake would wrap you up and whoop you if he give you one whoop, that means you got one day to live. If you go in the bush and they whoop you, that's how many times they whoop you, you're going to die. So boys and girls never play together unless it's ba baseball or basketball. That's it. No woods, no cl tree climbing, yeah, and all of this. But otherwise than that, no, no. Years and years when I grew up, then I found out why. <laughs> I didn't know it was a different, but <laughs> I thought we all were rough and tough. And uh, so one day I was going in the woods and the black snake jumped up and hit my leg. Man, I was running a mile an hour. I run home, I said, Mama, a black snake would be like a die. And she, she took the, uh, the broomstick and said, no, there's an antidote. No, you don't, she didn't say antidote, I can't remember. And she hit, hit me. And so that's cancel out that. I said, Whew. Yes. I sure didn't want to die. Yes. There ain't but no truth in that. <laughs> <laughs> boys and girls, boys. That's all it was. Keep the boys and girls apart. That was all the different. Oh. We, didn't, we was a sexual actor. We didn't even know what. You couldn't even mention breasts or, or titty or stuff. That. You could not know. You get a whooping. 
You look on the girl, you better keep, you have to keep that to yourself. <laughs> you couldn't tell the girl, I see you a draw. I go and tell mama, I go and tell, tell uh, auntie, and oh man, you get a whooping. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> Break a glass, whooping. <laughs> this will go to bed and you in there talking, whooping. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about abuse. <laughs> they don't know what abuse is. <laughs> I'll I, I, be honest, I'm the only black person that I know of that cough. Now, there might be some blacks, but I'm saying in this, in, 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 yeah, this area, okay. from Myrtle Beach all the way to Charleston or Columbia, okay. I, is, I've never heard of anyone else or even seen them. Okay. But uh, w I, I fall in love with it is one time I had a, a ranger, which was a, a white guy, and he, he's the guy that helped me to be a uh, timber foreman which at that time, you know, was a separation between black and white. And I, made, and, and I had an idea that I wanted to give him something special. And one day I was walking through the swamp and I saw that uh, cypress knee. And I said, wow. And I went there and got the chainsaw and cut it, took it home and let it dry and made a lamp out of it. And that thing was so pretty. And then somebody else saw it in his office. And then after that, this one wanted and that one wanted. But now there was a black guy in McLaren who used to do a uh, Cypress lamp. Uh, uh, and his name was Willie Blake. Okay. You see, he, you know, I don't know about his background and that, but when we used to come, he used to make the, uh, uh, the Cypress knee uh, lamp and the Cypress knee and the bottom of the Cypress tree he used to make cloth. And we, you know, we used to see it, but I never did thought it was in my family. You see what I'm saying? I never thought it was in my family until years later, I found out that it was. And so see, then I got more fascinated because my brother had already uh, was doing the walking stick. So I said, well, you know, I'm gonna try. That's this. So I tried a Cypress knee. And being a, a black person, I figure, you know, because my father don't, didn't carve the things that I'm carving. Right. My brother didn't carve the things that I'm carving now. Okay. So I took it to a, 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 a higher level, in which I figure if my grand or, or my sons uh, do it, they would take it to a, another level. But I'm the only some person that still do natural sticks. And a lot of people uh, get confused when I say natural stick. These are natural stick from South Carolina. Okay. Uh, these are oak, dogwood, hickory, cherry, maple, uh, some pine, some cypress. This is most of the wood that my father used was uh, dogwood because it already had a natural handle. And then each handle each sticks are different. So that's what I, I love about my stuff. When somebody stop out here, they're not going, like you go get a metal stick and every time you walk, go click, 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 click. Look, sound like somebody following you. Yes. Yes. And a lot of people want to get rid of that metal stick and rather have walk with a stick that don't make them look old. Plus, when they see like an eagle head on the top of something, the people forgot that they got a problem. They're more fascinated with the stick than the man or the woman. So see, that's what make my stick different from anybody else. Because if you go and, uh, and, and what I'm so proud about is that when, when I see other people's sticks, and then they said uh, the, the stick that have the curve in it and tell people that's oak, there's no oak you can soak or cut to bend like that. It's pine. <laughs> it's pine cut out of, a, out of a two by four or a one by four, and they just shave it down and, and uh, make it at that curve. There's, and I t uh, like to tell people, I hate to hurt your feelings. No, oak will not bend. No. And, and, uh, and the other thing is that I customize sticks. That my, I got probably 100 sticks out there, and there's no two alike. And I've been in this business now for almost 28 years and I haven't found two stick yet 
alike. So that's the difference in my stick from everybody else's stick. But when they go on the internet and they, they see these twist sticks and all like this, they don't, they don't know what they're buying. They, they, they think they're buying oak, they think they're buying, uh, most people want oak, hickory, dogwood, cherry. Because those are supposed to be the hardest wood. Yes, people will tell you that. Hard because they have to use, they can't use a little uh, drama tool on it to, to, to cut. All of my sticks are made. Now I do have to use a uh, machine on some of them because my finger's too big to get in some of the cracks. So I do use it on there, but all of my sticks are handmade and nature made. So when you buy one of my sticks, you're getting a real deal. I'll put it like this. I'm a holiness person. I was, I was born Methodist, okay. but I was redeemed by holiness. Okay. So, but it's the same God. Right. It's just one wants you to live right. And you have to make that choice if you want to drink, smoke. Uh, I've been married for 42 years, haven't cheated, never had a fight with my wife. We argue about who's the best in the Bible or who's the best scholar. But for our kids, they never heard us curse, never seen us drink. We all eat. My mother taught us how to eat together. My father and mother taught us how to eat together. But they still don't serve me first, but that, that, that's all right. But we eat together. And if you go to any one of my kids' house today, they're going to eat together. See, it's a tradition that we carry on. And that's how my religion sort of changed me to be a man saying, I don't have to go out and party. I don't care if someone else go out and party or do what they want to do. But uh, the Bible says, as far as my house, this is what I want. So because I went into that, I also became a minister, a minister of the word. So in, ad in order to show an example, I have to become an example. So see, and it was, uh, a lot of people don't believe in prophecy, but I had a heart desire to do this way before I retired, but I never told no one. I just, I just, one day, you know, when I retire, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. And this lady said, walked up to me, don't even know her, and she said, God said, open up your business. I said, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. When she left, I said, I ain't got a pot to <laughs> pee in and a wonder to throw them out. I said, Lord, I said, these people come around here and say these things to mine. I'm in holiness now. I see people come around here and tell me, oh, I can start a business that I ain't got no money. Got, got eight kids, you know, f f four of my own, five of my own kids at the house, eight more staying there. And we went to a church one night, and this, it was a man walk up to me and say, God said, this is your last time. Open up your business. I done been here 28 years. And I started out with zero. I went in the woods. I had to go in the woods, get my own wood. I had to borrow. Uh, but I had my father old carver knife, which he had made out of an old oyster knife. So that was given to me. All I had to do was make the material. So after I made that, I sat up right there in McClendenville, and it was, God had blessed me. So that's what I believe in my religion and how it helped me. Now somebody else, I can't, uh, right, right. can't, can't talk for them. Yes, yes. But I can speak for myself and say, uh, like say, uh, the interview, uh, I had some uh, people put papers, um, you know, write article and my business and people start calling. Mr. Williams, I saw this and I see this. I need this. I need that. And I need that. I don't, and a lot of people think that I'm only because my father, when I mean I took it to a different level, my father probably couldn't carve a bear if the bear stood there and turned into wood. <laughs> now, my brother might have. Charles might now. But then, see, I make anything that anybody want besides a walking stick. I've made bear, eagle, I made a statue of a, uh, 
a, a tutu woman with a basket on her head. You know, people want something that unusual from everybody else. But then my price is reasonable. I don't go because you own a Ford dealership, then I'm going to charge you an arm and a leg. We discussed that a price of what you could afford, not because I love it. And I love a challenge. When somebody said, uh, the guy said, I want you to make me a 1956 uh, Chevrolet. I, he said, could you do it? I said, uh, when do you want it? <laughs> never made it before in my life now. Never made one before. Guy called, motorcycle guy, wanted a motorcycle. Never made a motorcycle in my life. But you see, that's why I say God said to give us gift and talent. All of we got some type of talent. All of we ain't drunk and bum. That may, but they're better talent than me. <laughs> I got to drink a glass of wine. I think I'm out of here. <laughs> that two years ago, uh, Mr. Raleigh introduced me into the Gullah uh, family. And that I was proud. I was proud because they said, you know, one time I think you had to, it was only uh, like white, uh, and then they turned it around and said, now everybody should be added into it. And, and they, uh, they uh, took me down there to uh, Hilton Head and uh, introduced me into that uh, culture. Yeah, and then I met, the first time I met, uh, the uh, defense uh, with the guy named Mr. The guy that does the fence. I can't remember his name, but he died now, Mr. Uh, from Charleston. And uh, I met his uh, nephew. That, and then he took over from him. Then I met ladies from uh, Buford that does sweet grass basket. But to find out, they, are, they move out of... Uh, out of Mount Pleasant to Beaufort, and then there's a, uh, a family that live on a Hilton Head that does sweetgrass basket and never born, never, he was, his parents was born in Mount Pleasant, but the condition already moved to Hilton Head, and he, he went one of the few there. And so, see, I, I didn't know the, yeah, and, but they never met a black woodcarver either. <laughs> So both of us, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, man, this, this, and you know, and uh, it was, to me it was exciting to see how the Gullah uh, uh, culture are now being looked at, not just as a white or a black thing, but a togetherness thing, that we all got talent. And, and for this world to get where that now, we all had to come, all the cultures come together. I wish we all as people can do that. Yeah, that would have been good. But I, I, but that joint, me and my wife went there. Oh man, I, I almost cry. I'll be honest. I I had love it. I said, dog, you know, I didn't, you know, but uh, to seeing other pe other black culture, I didn't, you know, like this guy could have painted any portrait. I didn't know. Didn't know about it, and they didn't know about me either. So you see, we 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 just having a ball with one another. And I didn't know you can do that. Yeah, because you fi figure everything. Uh, there's some white guys that call the guy the stick maker. And, and uh, when I started here probably 20 something years ago, he stopped and he said, uh, Mr. Williams, is there any way you think you can teach me this? I said, man, I tell you, like my brother said, if I teach you now, I said, he lived in McLaren, but he said, I can go. 50 miles that side and 50 miles this side, but don't stop in the middle. I said, which one you want to do? And he told me what he wanted to do, and now he go around all to the campsite uh, in South Carolina and come home, make some more stick and make that trip. And I sat there and showed him how to do it, and now he, 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 is, he is good. I'll tell you, I've met a lot of interesting people in this. I, 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 now, you know, there's good and bad. 
Because some people stop out here, ask for the five dollar stick. Right. And I tell them, no, I don't have any five dollar stick. And over the years I've learned, uh, I, uh, I'm not a crackhead. Uh, I do work for a living. I said, if you stop here to, to test my patient, I said, I'm Job. I said, I've got a lot of patience, so if you want a stick, I'll say you stick. But I said, now you know good and well, there's no such thing as no five dollar stick. You know, but people try to tell you, they, they go to Bahamas, and the wood over there is different. The, the culture over there is different. The people, they'll sell you a hundred dollar stick for five dollars because they don't have anything. They believe that a hand and a bird in the hand is better than the bird in the bush. So when they come here and they see me side the road, they figure, well, okay, I'm gonna give them a bargain, but they want a bargain to the bargain to the five dollar. And, and you know, you look at some of my stuff, it didn't take no five days to make some of these sticks. It take months. And so, you know, I've, I've met the good, but I've met more good than bad. And then the people that I met, like y'all, uh, you know, that do the interview and all like this, I do get exposed, you know, exposure to other people to let them know that there is a black carver. And we, and I do do, and I didn't, uh, go to school or anything, all these things was just, uh, what you say, mother give or mother nature give to me. And then the other thing is uh, that all uh, my wife, that she only goes on road trip with me. <laughs> she wouldn't sit out here. <laughs> she said, she ain't got no patience. She said, I don't, and so that's the other thing, you have to have patience. And most of all, I love what I do. Yes.